In 1890, Henrik Hoffman painted a picture of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is the painting up here on the screen. This painting was sold to a man by the name of John Zile, who treasured that painting so much that when his home was destroyed by the great San Francisco earthquake and fire of 1906, out of all the things he could have rescued and removed from his house, that was the only thing he saved. That one painting. Everything else totally destroyed. And how grateful we are for that uh, because we're still able to enjoy that today. Uh, back in 1932, John D. Rockefeller Jr. bought that painting and he donated it to Riverside Church, which is in New York City. And Rockefeller said of this painting, he said, I've always been interested in the picture, but I never felt that an individual ought to possess such a rare treasure. I feel that it should be made available to the general public, and it is in that church to this day. And you could go there in New York City and you could visit that church and you could see that painting. Well, this next photo on the screen, this is a, a, a photo of a picture that hangs on the wall in my office at home. And I inherited that from my grandparents after my grandmother died a few years ago. It's a sepia reproduction print of Hoffman's painting of Jesus praying agonizingly in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's very old. In fact, from the time I was just a little kid, I always remember that painting or that picture hanging on the wall uh, above the landing going up to the second floor of my grandparents' home, hung there for, for years and years and years. And because of its association with my grandparents, of course, this picture is something that I treasure. But I also treasure it because of what it depicts. When Jesus went to the garden, he engaged in a battle physically and mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I mean, it is hard, really, to comprehend what he must have been feeling about events that would soon be happening when he would be arrested and he would be brutally beaten and he would be crucified on that cross. Well, we're in the second sermon of our message series. And if you didn't get a copy yet of the study guide, you can pick one up on the entryway table. Sermon number two is what we're on today. And in the weeks leading up to Easter, we're looking at the sacrifice of Jesus. Today, we consider the crushing stress that our Lord felt when he was in the garden that night. And then what I hope to do is get us to note some observations about Jesus that might just help us in our own times of need. Because perhaps you have felt the crush of stress or the crush of depression or emotional darkness that just can envelop us and, and leave us just kind of feeling all alone and by ourselves. And the question is, how can we prepare for times of crushing in our own spirit? In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 26, he tells us that after Jesus and his disciples went out, uh, or, or after they shared in the Last Supper in the upper room, then they went out to the Mount of Olives. They went to this Garden of Gethsemane at the foot of the mountain just outside of Jerusalem. It's still around today. And when they went there, it was around midnight, maybe one o'clock in the morning. Now in the Hebrew language, Gethsemane means oil press. We're not talking about the kind of oil that you put into your cars. We're talking about olive oil. And apparently at one time there was an olive press in the vicinity of this garden. In the ancient process of producing olive oil, olives were gathered in tightly woven baskets and they were pressed three times. Three times they were pressed hard and the husks of the olives remained in that basket and the oil would seep out through the seams. It's interesting, isn't it, that in the garden, Jesus prays how many times? Three times Jesus prays in the garden of Gethsemane. And his anxiety caused him to sweat like drops of blood. Jesus went to this place of tranquility as he was experiencing the crush of this spiritual battle unfolding against him. And I'm just wondering this morning, where do you go when you feel crushed by your problems? What do you do when you feel crushed by the things that just kind of overwhelm you? The things that just kind of plague you and work against you? In looking to Jesus, we can find help 
when it seems like you're in that olive press of life, when every last drop of oil is, it just seems to be squeezed from you. So open up your Bible or open up your smartphone to Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. That's where we're going to be this morning. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. And let's see what we can learn from Jesus about preparing for and getting through those tough times of crushing. One thing that helped him to keep going is Jesus sought support from his friends. Mark 14, verses 32 through 34, look at it. It says, They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Judas is gone by now, betraying the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And so Jesus asks eight of his 11 disciples who are there to sit along the entrance to the garden while he goes further in to pray. And so it's kind of like he wanted them to guard the area so that this special time of solitude and prayer could be protected from being intruded upon by somebody who didn't know that he was there. And we see this picture that they're there for him. His friends, they're there. And then Jesus asks the other three disciples, do you know, remember their names? Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. He asked Peter, James, and John to go further into the garden with him. And this is where Jesus becomes deeply distressed. He becomes deeply troubled. He begins to grieve. He suffers horribly. This is a time of terror for Jesus. It was a time of extreme inner unrest. And I find it especially significant that Jesus didn't just go through this by himself. He brings his believing friends with him. He doesn't hide his feelings from Peter, James, and John either. He lets them in on what he's feeling. It's like he's saying, I'm overwhelmed. I feel like I can't even move anymore. I feel like I can't even breathe. And I'm struggling, so sit here and pray with me. He says, pray for me. In times of stress, it helps to know and to have others with you. Clara Null tells of the time when she was stressed out. It was one of the worst days of her life. The washing machine broke down. The phone kept ringing. Her head ached. And the mail carrier brought a bill for which she had no money to pay. And she's wondering, what in the world is she going to do? Almost to the breaking point, she lifts her one-year-old into his high chair. And then she lays her head against the tray. And she begins to cry. I mean, she's just weeping. And without a word... Her son took out the pacifier from his mouth and he stuck it in hers. <laughs> now maybe that's not the help that we need in times like that. But I got to believe that that little one-year-old put a smile on his mama's face that day. And it helped her to carry on because she knew he cared, right? He, in his own little way, he showed he cared and he loved his mother. Why would Jesus want his friends to be near him when he was going through such mental and emotional anguish? I, I, anguish. I, I don't know about you. Often, I just want to be left alone. You know, I, I don't necessarily want to talk about my feelings with anyone. I mean, it's hard enough for me to talk about my feelings with my wife, let alone anyone else, right? <laughs> but Jesus shows us a different way. Think about a time when you're, you've gone through some deep grief, and maybe it was the time when... You lost your best friend, or maybe it was a, a time, at, you know, after some long private struggle, and then all of a sudden it becomes public knowledge, and, and it's embarrassing, and you're struggling, and maybe it's an addiction that tormented you. Maybe it's financial ruin because of credit card debt, or maybe gambling, or sexual sin that has been discovered, or, or some kind of theft, or unethical action at work. Or maybe you're fired from your job or let go for some reason and you're just wondering, how in the world are you ever going to make it now? It, it could be any number of things that brings you grief. Maybe, maybe a time of distress comes on you when you've lost your mom or your dad or when you've lost your spouse or a child. And Jesus didn't unload his deepest feelings and struggles with just anybody. 
but he did with the closest people in his life on earth. Jesus opened up to them, and he sought their support, and he sought their care. And I want to encourage you to deep, develop deep friendships with people in this church. Develop deep friendships with the people around you. Because they will help you. They are here for you. They are believers in Christ like you. And they care about you. Doesn't mean they're always perfect. We're not perfect. If you're looking for a perfect church, you might want to go somewhere else. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but we care about you. And we love you. We'll be there for you. And as Jesus dealt with being crushed, he did something else too. He reached out to God and invited his presence to help him through this time of trouble. Jesus prayed. And it helped him to see the way of God clearly. Mark 14, verses 35 through 38, it says, Going a little further, he fell to the ground and he prayed that if possible the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. <laughs> Simon, he says to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you just keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you'll not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, finish it with me, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, Jesus is struggling with what he knows he has to do. And as he walks through the garden that day, he falls to the ground and he prays. And he keeps doing this, falling to the ground and praying, falling to the ground and praying. Now, his relationship with the Heavenly Father is not some surfacey, fair weather, I'll follow you if things go my way kind of relationship. I've heard, you've probably heard too, maybe you've even said this, maybe I've said this. People through the years, you know, kind of when we say to God, Lord, you know, if you just help me to get through this, I'll start going to church more. <laughs> or, or we say, you know, Lord, if you can just help me to get this paid off, I'll start giving more. Right? There, but there was none of that as Jesus seeks the Father's sustenance and guidance in this difficult time. Even though Jesus prays, everything is possible with you, Father, yet not what I will, what you will. He isn't trying to bargain with God as he asks God to take this cup from him. He's not trying to bargain with God as if to try and manipulate him like we so often do when we try to strike deals with the Lord. Here we see the true human side of Jesus. He's not looking forward to the suffering that he's about to go through. But he is committed to finishing the work of God's salvation by becoming our sacrificial sin substitute. And he follows his, please take this cup with me, or please, <laughs> please take this cup from me, with, yet, yeah, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And as Jesus prays, it helps him to see the way of God clearly, doesn't it? And he's praying to the Lord, you know, I, I don't want to go through this. Take this cup from me. Yet, Lord, not as I will, but as you will. It strengthens his devotion to the Father. It's what allows him to become the way, the truth, and the life for you and me. It appears, however, that the disciples struggled in this work of praying as Jesus requested. Because what do they do? They fall asleep. Did they? I kind of sound like that when I sleep too, don't I? <laughs> did, they, <laughs> did they not sense the danger and the urgency of the moment, I wonder? You know, did they, did they find praying to be boring and that's why they fell asleep? Was it simply that just that, you know, it was late and after a long day they just couldn't keep their minds engaged in prayer any longer? Like kind of when we go to bed and we, we lay down and we say our prayers and we fall asleep mid-sentence, right? And then we wake up in the morning and go, Amen! <laughs> I don't know. But, but I do know this. Jesus connects praying with staying spiritually alert and staying in tune with God's will so that we will know his will and so that we will do his will. How can I say that? Why do I say that? Because look at verse 38. Look at verse 38. Why does Jesus tell Peter, James, and John to watch and pray? Why? So that they will not fall into temptation. That's right. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
Our intentions are good. We just don't always follow through, do we? We often fall through. And Jesus says, pray and watch so you'll stay alert. So that you won't fall into temptation. Jesus knows us so well, doesn't he? Peter missed this lesson that night in the garden. Jesus prayed and he saw his way to the Father's will. But Peter slept and later deserted Jesus out of fear. Even though earlier Peter had said, Lord, even if all these other guys desert you, I won't desert you. I'll stay there with you. He didn't, did he? (laughs) But you know, the good news is, Peter did learn the lesson of connecting prayer to heart transformation and faithful living. Because years later, some 20 or 30 years later, when he's writing his letters, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, that's going out to the churches, in 1 Peter 4, 7, and, and in 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9, Peter would write this. Be alert and sober in your mind so that you may pray. Why? Because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. I just got to wonder... As Peter's writing those words, is he remembering 30 years earlier when he was with Jesus in the garden? I'll bet he is. He's learned the lesson. Let me tell you, let me just ask you, when when you're struggling with something, maybe it's big, maybe it's small, do you ever take the time to pray and invite the presence of God into your situation? Because you see, Jesus teaches us to pray because just as it helped him to see the way of God clearly, so will it help you and me to know the ways of God clearly and to represent him well, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing. Well, I can see one more insight in this episode of Jesus in the Garden that can help us get through the tough times when it feels like our spirit is just being crushed. Preparation for spiritual battle is constant. It's too late to prepare once the crushing starts. Look at Mark 14, verses 39 through 42. There we read, Once more, he, referring to Jesus, went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. (laughs) They did not even know what to say to him at that point. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. (laughs) He asks, are you still sleeping and resting? I see some of you are. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Let me tell you, Jesus wasn't able to go through his arrest and go through those beatings and those sham trials and finally being nailed to a cross by simply deciding at the last moment, yeah, I'll do this. No, he was only able to follow through with doing God's will, doing the right thing, because for his whole life, he prepared to stand for God. I mean, think about this. Look at Jesus' life. Uh, just a couple, let's go back a couple of episodes. Remember when he was 12 years old? Without his parents even knowing it, he goes into the Jerusalem temple to learn about the Bible's message and to study that and to learn more from the teachers who were there. Luke 2, verse 46, it says, After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Here's an application for us. When's the last time you opened up the Bible to read it for yourself? (laughs) When's the last time you studied the Bible with a group of other people who are trying to prepare their life and live that for God as well? who are learning what the Bible actually says. So that maybe, for instance, somebody comes up to you and they challenge you on some biblical detail or moral issue or they want to know something about how to come into the presence of God and be saved so they can go to heaven. Then you can respond to them because you know what the Bible says. You know what the Bible means. But if you don't study it, if you don't read it, how are you going to know? Jesus further prepared when at the start of his ministry, when he was 30 years old, He fasted and prayed before going public in his ministry. And so in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, it tells us Jesus went into the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 days. And during that time, he was tempted to walk away from God. And he was tempted to do the very opposite of what God desired. When Satan offered to give him unlimited provision, unlimited popularity, and power. 
If only our Lord would give his devotion to the devil. The devil would not give him a hard time throughout his whole life if, he, if Jesus would just bow down and worship him. And he, Jesus would have all these benefits. But no, you see, Jesus had been fasting and praying. He stands up to the challenge. He quotes Bible truths back to Satan. And he applies its message to the situation that's unfolding there. You don't stand against temptation unless you have prepared for the spiritual battle continually throughout your life. We will falter eternally unless we've been feasting on a steady diet of God's worldview as brought out in the Bible's principles. You know, think about this physically, right? The healthiest people physically are generally, I'm speaking generally now, those who have continually paid attention to exercising throughout their life and they've paid attention to eating the right foods and don't, don't, look, don't look at my body, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> And they leave the unhealthy stuff off to the side, right? And then when things like sickness attacks them, they're stronger to withstand it. Or think about it like this. You know, spring break is about to come. And I know right now the gyms are full of people who are working out to lose weight and get in shape because they want their beach bod to look good. Speaking from personal experience, <laughs> I can tell you that if you want to start working out and losing weight just two days before you leave for vacation... You won't have the beach bod you want. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Same is true for us spiritually. If you want to be able to respond thoughtfully to people from a biblical worldview, you have to be digging into God's word personally on a daily basis. And you have to be digging into God's word and his message by studying the Bible with other Christians weekly. And we offer Bible uh, studies here on a weekly basis. And I want to encourage you to get involved with that. Because once the crushing starts in your spirit, it's too late to prepare at that point. I mean, isn't that what's happening here in the Garden of Gethsemane that night? Jesus, he goes back to his disciples and for the third time he finds them asleep instead of praying for spiritual insight and strength. And he's like, ugh, you guys, you're sleeping again. Instead of getting ready for this time of spiritual battle when you have the chance and there's this relative peace. Okay, well, there's nothing more that we can do right now. Get up, let's do this. They're coming for me. <laughs> and the disciples, what are they? Like, whoa, whoa, what? Wait, what do you mean? <laughs> Verse 40 says they didn't even know what to say to them. They start freaking out when the soldiers show up. At first, you know, they're going to fight, right? They're going to protect themselves. Then they all flee. Every single one of them deserts Jesus at that moment, and he's standing there with all this army around him. In fact, it's kind of funny because when Jesus speaks, okay, do what you've come to do, they all of a sudden, like, all oh, bow down to the ground. <laughs> that, that's Jesus, our king of kings. But no, he, he submits. They, the disciples all run away. Do you see why preparation for spiritual battle is constant? It's too late once the crushing starts. Our response to life's troubles and chaos today is the result of choices we've made from the past all the way up to this point. And when it comes to your walk with the Lord, when it comes to being ready to share the message about Jesus with family and friends, when it comes to preparing for God to transform your life so that you can fit perfectly in his heaven, are you paying attention? Are you doing what it takes to become the man or woman that God wants you to be? Are you seeing our world through the eyes of God from a biblical worldview so that you can be part of the solution in helping life to flourish? A couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> I was leading the midweek Bible study here at the church. We, we hold it in the back there. and We were talking about making choices that can change your life forever. And more specifically, our group was talking that night about choosing to have authenticity and integrity so that we're living a lifestyle of genuine faith, even when things get tough, even when the going gets rough. And, and uh, the thought was that, you know, those who know us best should be able to testify that our life reflects the same love and devotion to God when we're alone as when we're in public. Now, Marie, she was in our group that night, and she commented that the older we get, the more we realize our time is getting shorter. And she goes, you know what? We start asking ourselves, the older we get, what am I living for? 
And, and, and what do I want to still accomplish with my life? And it's so right, isn't it? Striving to live a life of spiritual authenticity will cause you to reevaluate your purposes and, and to want to get your act together. And, and at one point, Marie says in our Bible study, she says, I wish I had been more self-disciplined when I was younger so I could be further along right now. And Carol and others who were there kind of made similar comments. Can you relate? It's so true, isn't it? Our challenge is to realize time is always short and to understand we never know when the call of duty is going to ring out, whether it has to do with our marriage or with our parenting or with our singleness or our work or school or some cultural battle going on whether it has to do with seeing a need and, and being there to care for that person and share and serve them. It's like when the fire siren here in town goes off. Any of you ever hear that? <laughs> Who hasn't heard the fire siren here in town go off? I mean, these, think about this. These firefighters, these first responders, they have to be ready to go right now. They can't just now be opening up the book and learn how to put out a fire. They can't just now start thinking about and looking around for all their firefighting equipment and their gear and getting it together. They can't just now be figuring out, you know, how to drive the fire truck and how to connect the hoses and how the pumps work. They have to already have done all of that. Because when the fire siren goes off, it's time to act. It's time to move. And the same is true for us spiritually. We are all in a spiritual battle all the time. And the question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Jesus shows us that we prepare for times of crushing in our life by leaning into the support of close Christian friends and by praying fervently to God, praying so that we can be clear about his will and worldview, and by constantly preparing to be useful for God's causes. At any time, wherever we are, Jesus was intentional about preparing for times of spiritual crushing. And if our Lord was intentional about that, shouldn't we be? Shouldn't we also be intentional about our journey with the Lord so that we can make a difference for him and do something about it? Oh, in fact, I want to encourage you to do that. Do something about it. We're in a season of reflection leading up to Easter. This is a great time to start getting serious about your walk with the Lord. What will you do about it this week? Because you see, Jesus was crushed for your sins that crushing leads to our salvation. We cannot earn our salvation as if there's something we can do to erase all the wrong and the ugliness that's within us. No, we trust in Jesus to save us and the salvation that he gives. By faith and baptism, we are united with him, clothed with him, as Paul puts it in his letter to the Galatians, and he erases all that's wrong within us. And more than that, he puts us on that path of second chances. I love that our God is a God of second chances, don't you? He's a God of second chances. But maybe as you've listened this morning, the Holy Spirit's just kind of speaking to your heart and there's something in your life that no longer has a place there. Maybe it's some illicit relationship or maybe it's your unfair treatment towards another person. Maybe it's an attitude of prejudice or maybe it's an attitude of revenge that needs to go, needs to get out of your life. Whatever it is, you're in the garden and you're facing a tough decision and you're wrestling with the cup God has called to your attention. It's time that we walk with our Savior and walk where he walked and kneel with him at Gethsemane. It's time for you and me to search our life and to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, how grateful we are that Jesus was willing to go to the cross even, even though we see him struggle, even though we know he didn't want to have that pain. But he did want to finish the work that you'd given him. And for that we are ever grateful that he never backed away. And Lord, may we with courage continue on in our life of faith. May we Father, prepare for the time when crushing comes into our heart, into our life, into our soul. May we be faithful in praying. May we be a good friend to those 
who maybe are suffering and need your presence and need our presence to be with them as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Easter. But we also know before there was Easter, there was the suffering of the cross. There was that Good Friday. And so as we reflect on the agony our Lord went through, that agony of sacrifice, may it just inspire us in our faith and draw us closer to your love. May we leave here today with your favor and blessing and leave stronger than when we first came in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.